Hi, this is Jessel. Just before we start the podcast, please go and check out my brand new album. It's called One Minute TikTok Anthems, and it's 20 tracks. Each one is one minute long, hence the name. It's available to purchase and stream on all major platforms. So go check it out. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gents, we are back after another little break, and uh, this time we are going to be, to, going to be talking about um, a couple of films that were released a little while back. Everything seems like years ago now, but this was legitimately a few years ago. So the first one was released in 2015, and the next one was released in 2017, and they are films helmed by the director Chloe Zhao. Is that, um, I think I'm like pronouncing that correctly is that right probably, i think it's jow jow yeah okay and yeah the two very interesting films rashad was like okay you got to check these out and i knew about her as a director but i just hadn't happened to have checked out the films and she has a couple of bigger ones coming out i think one's already hit the states which is called nomad land only for the festivals okay i think here the release date is january the first but i mean at the moment <laughs> who knows <laughs> Yeah. No idea if that's going to happen or not. So, I mean, I just hope they at least release it, like, you know, on streaming or for purchase or whatever at home. Because, you know, I, I get that, okay, cinemas, it's a shame, blah, 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 blah. But at least, like, let people like me see it. And, I mean, to to wit that point, um, the first film we're talking about is literally not available in any way, shape or form in the UK. You cannot stream it. You cannot buy it. Nothing. And I was just like... How is this even possible in this day and age? And this is not like some tiny, you know, super indie director or something. I just, I just couldn't believe it. Anyway, and then the film she's doing after that is called The Eternals, which is a, a Marvel Cinematic Universe one. So it's like huge, huge, huge jump up in terms of budget, and um, I'm sure in terms of like wider recognition. But the ones we're talking about today are uh, Songs My Brothers Taught Me, which was a 2015 one, and the Rider, which was in 2017, which got a bit more critical acclaim for sure, a bit wider acclaim. It was on many, many lists, uh, top 10 lists from film critics in that year, won competitions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but yeah, what we'll do first is, as usual, we will have a spoiler-free section, just kind of describing, you know, a few things about the films themselves. And then we will have a short break and get into the spoiler section. So, Rashad... So first of all, why did you pick these two films? Um, I was doing a bunch of research a while ago. It's interesting. Um, there's there's two reasons. I mean, in general, I always try, like, because I tried to become a filmmaker back in my younger days or whatever, it didn't necessarily work out. So I still try to look out for, like, when I hear, like, from the underground, like, people like to look out for, I try to go for that kind of stuff. And also, Marvel tends to have a habit of they also go into those same waters and try to find directors that people haven't discovered yet and try to like, I mean, I guess the, the, the cynical thing would be is that they're not known names. So you can kind of like work with them better than like a Steven Spielberg or like a Ridley Scott or something like that. They're more, the people who are up and coming are more um, available to work with them rather than like say, this is the way it has to go or I'm walking or whatever. Um, but they do pull out people like Ryan Coogler, Taka Waititi, uh, Kate Shortland, like so many directors that are, critically acclaimed or like respected from that world, not necessarily the mainstream. And uh, I think their track record has been pretty strong so far. So I guess those two things kind of hit me toward putting her on my radar. And what did you kind of make of these films initially um, in terms of, you know, how it hit you and what you expected versus what you received? It's interesting because there was, this, it's interesting because there was this, something that she said recently that, um, I, 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 it kind of reminds me of like how people, when you have a certain perception in the year 2020 to like the last couple of years where, um, 
people have an ideal of saying that uh, whatever your viewpoint on a certain particular situation is, is like some people prefer for you to kind of be like, if you don't talk about a situation or a character or a theme a certain way, then you're kind of against it because it doesn't fit their worldview. And she said recently that, um, cause I, I did see her third movie, no man land at a film festival, but, um, she made the point of saying that she shot, this is not spoiling for the, for no man land, but there's a scene where the main character works at Amazon and there were, I mean, it's overall, it's overwhelmingly critically acclaimed, but maybe like a few people who are saying like, why didn't you kind of like go into the faults, the faults of Amazon or whatever like that? And her kind of thing is like, my job is not to be didactic. My job is to tell the story from the character's point of view and you make your own decision. So um, there's been kind of a thing lately with uh, with filmmaking. I don't know if, if, if you see it the same way, Jessel, but um, it's been kind of like if you don't make a movie about a certain concept a certain way, then you're being quote unquote irresponsible because you're not putting a particular point of view rather than letting the story tell itself and you come to your own conclusion. So um, going back to make, going back to that point, um, watching these two movies, she kind of does do that in a sense where it's like you watch the story. It's kind of like a slice of life. You see it for yourself and then you kind of draw your own conclusions rather than um, a character giving a great speech about what the big theme is. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think also the other thing is with Nomadland, I haven't seen it yet because, like I said, it hasn't been released here, but it is based on a book. So if you want, you can just go read the source material and then, you know, garner from that what you need to and then compare and contrast it with the film. Whereas these two, um, I mean, certainly the second one is definitely not based on a book um, because I was I managed to get a bit of time to read it, uh, read about it rather, because I only just finished the film like about like an hour ago or something. And the first one, I'm not sure. I don't think it's based on a book or anything like that. Um, I think she just wrote the screenplay. Well, like not just, but just wrote. She was the there. Screenplay. She was there with those people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think she what she kind of said is that she she didn't want to make a documentary. She wanted to kind of make an actual sort of semi-fiction film that would elicit more truth than a documentary would kind of not lull people into a false sense of security, but just make them feel at ease so that they could be more truthful. And I think that's probably what happened in a, in a way. Um, But if I give a sort of quick description of what the film's, are in essence in, in like a non-spoilerish way. So the first one is, um, which was her, her sort of proper full debut is songs. My brothers taught me. So 2015 it's, and they're both kind of like, I guess modern Westerns in a way, but they're both kind of like rooted in native American culture. And they're both based in Dakota. Now forgive me. My knowledge of American geography is like pretty poor, obviously, but um, this is where we'll come, come to you in the spoiler section so that you can sort of uh, expound upon everything. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of like uh, Lakota Sioux um, situations, both of them, where their communities are the kind of focal points and the lead character. Well, I think pretty much most of the characters are from those communities as well. And um, they, they're kind of like, there's so many similarities between the two films. They really center mostly on young male leads who have siblings and one parent and that parent kind of like you know there's there's many a struggle and it's kind of like I mean you could I guess say they're slightly depressing I mean it really is kind of like bad situation after bad situation but there's always like this glimmer of hope always and I guess like songs my brothers taught me is um a bit more kind of in your face about it in certain ways. And then you kind of go fast forward two years to the rider. And that is just basically based on a true story, which I didn't know until after the film. So I was kind of watching the film because I, I like to go into these things kind of a bit more blind and, you know, not watch the, the trailers and all that kind of stuff. So afterwards I was like, no way this whole, pretty much the whole thing was just like really rooted in, in such reality. And I was like, wow. Okay, fine. That kind of like, definitely kicked it up a couple of notches to me so um but that anyway sorry i'm doing a bad job of explaining and spoiler free the rider is basically about um a young rodeo rider who is on the come up and ends up having a, an accident in a rodeo and gets kicked in the head by a horse and ends up getting some brain damage huge scar on his head um the doctors say look you can never ride again and um he's he's got his father there uh, he's got a young autistic uh, 
sibling sister and um and it's just kind of like about his struggle about wanting to get back on the saddle versus what he can physically do and um Oh, I mean, I tell you what, I think that's one of those films. I can already just say now that that's going to linger with me. I think Songs My Brothers Taught Me, I really liked it. But The Rider is like, I can see why that was on so many top 10 lists. So I tell you what, let's take a short pause for the cause and we will come back with the spoiler section. Okay, so we're back. Let's get into it. So Rashad... First and foremost, what did you think about songs my brothers taught me? I thought it was really interesting because um, I have this joke on Twitter where, like, I I respect Terrence Malick, but um, but for me, to me, he's for, for me personally, I get why people worship him, and I get why Sinius kind of like have this like reverence for him. But to me, I've always felt like he's kind of like he does a story he's, he's he does lyrical shots it seems like very realistic but he always goes off on tangents where it's kind of like okay guy i got it can we get back to the point or whatever like that um for me personally i feel like she comes from that school she even admitted that she's like a terrence malick like acolyte or whatever like that but um but her more her she's more of trying to stay focused on the main character even though she did say in songs of my brother compared to the writer she felt like she, in a way, bit off more than she could chew in Song of the Brothers t- Taught Me because of the fact that she tried to make it more expansive in that movie by focusing on a couple of characters. And she felt like the budget couldn't was, couldn't hold up the entire movie from the, all different characters. So when she did the writer, she just made sure that within that budget, which is even le- which, which was lower than Songs of My Brother Taught Me, she was kind of saying, like, okay, if I just focus on this one character and this one character's point of view, then I can probably be more successful in getting the point I'm trying to make. Whereas in songs my brother taught me, even though people respected it and appreciated it, she kind of felt like it was slightly all over the place only because she felt like she wasn't as focused on the ideal in that movie as it was on the writer. So I'm glad you said that. Sorry to jump in, but I'm glad you said that because I, I was going to make exactly that kind of point. I mean, for me, the first hour of um, songs my brothers taught me is really good. Like I, I was really gripped actually and then the last half an hour it just went all over the place for me and like I barely remember what happened and I watched it two days ago so it kind of like uh, yeah I mean I I can see that Terrence Malick kind of like comparison but I I just think it it just lacked an ultimate focus and also I felt it it felt very telegraphed from pretty much the first few minutes of it I kind of like I I was like okay I do see where this is going to go I can see what's going to happen. I can see all the forks in the road and it's probably going to end up here. And then it ended up exactly pretty much like dot to dot what I thought it was going to do, which is quite rare for me because I'm not like, <laughs> not that clever, you know? So I was, I was kind of like, wow, geez, I actually predicted this film really well. But the problem was like just that half hour, uh, last half an hour, it just got really esoteric and just too kind of visual, too music video-ish at certain times. And, but I felt it was on a really good track. And that first hour I thought was really special. And I actually don't think, to be honest, that there was an issue with focusing on the brother and the sister um, because both of the, the storylines were fascinating. You know, I kind of thought halfway through, I was like, okay, she kind of dropped the brother and went into the sisters. I was like, okay, that's fine. You know, no problem, just go for it. But then it kind of just got all melded into one sort of giant fondue for the last half an hour and and then it, i don't know like i don't know what you think what do you think is that a harsh criticism no it didn't no it didn't i mean i mean if you if that's how you feel that's how you feel i wouldn't argue that to me i didn't have a problem with the um last half an hour i would i would say i would say this i would say that she is right in her assessment that the focus was stronger in the writer um but i do feel like you said is if if, if, if you were going to make criticism then i guess you could you could you can you could say in defending your position um, you could say that it did kind of go slightly a little bit more terrorist malady than it, than it should have in that last half, I guess. I guess if I was going to make a suggestion, I would have figured that if you for the last half, half an hour, it should have been just a brother and a sister and just completely focus on that relationship from, from that point on. And you, you kind of set up the brother situation, you have the sister situation. You kind of check in with the mom here and there once in a while. I mean, because I did like the one scene where um the 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 older brother who's in prison says to the, to the mother that... um. That when you, she says she went to church, she found God, and she's like, just make sure that's not a man 
that you neglect your other your your kids for again. Oh whatever, yeah, like that. yeah, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, the, one could argue if you wanted to argue from a from from perspective that um that whole entire scatter shot thing near this at at the third half is kind of like it kind of resembles like their lifestyles like they're all over the place. They don't have anything to really root themselves on up until like the very end. But uh, if there was a criticism or something that could be improved in that last half, I would have said to your point that you, you introduce the brother, you introduce the sister, and then you kind of like that last half, kind of like the rest of the rider, just have it from their perspective going all the way towards the end or whatever. But um, I didn't have the, that big of a problem as you did. But I do agree that the writer is like a far more sophisticated film. But I always go back to just f- for a first time movie. That's v- it's very difficult to even be that good your first time out. Most people aren't that good the first time out. So for for that to be that good, but the writer to be even better, that's still impressive to me. I completely agree. I mean, you, you know, I, I'm not, I don't want to nitpick on something that's just already a really good film and you know, kind of budgets that we're talking about and also the subject matter and and that willingness to throw yourself into a community. Because you're talking about a Chinese woman who's throwing herself into Native American culture and the community. And and initially I was kind of like, okay, well, how is this Chinese woman? You know, were were people slinging around the whole cultural appropriation tag at this? She made made jokes like how um, there were, there were people in that culture it kind of looked at her as like a hipster, like a hipster filmmaker. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to tell a story about the plenty of people. And they kind of like some of them didn't. She said it took them, it took her, it took them a long time to trust her to make those films the way they made those films. Both movies, like the same thing with that, with, with the culture in uh, the writer, with those guys, and uh, with the, the the straight up Indian culture, Native American culture, and uh, Songs My Brother Told Me. She said there were situations where people, even like, a, she said there was one story where she got robbed, her place got robbed, and she lost all her equipment. And the police officers, when they, when they, she told about them, they were kind of, they were kind of like looking at her like, okay, that's what you get for trying to like uh, uh, encroach on our territory. Not saying it like, like right out to her like that, but that was like the inflection that they gave to her. So it took her a long time because, unfortunately, in Hollywood, when Hollywood, whenever, whenever Hollywood or certain filmmakers try to go into certain cultures. There are a lot of them that are just there for their own ego and don't respect the culture. So it took her a while to kind of do that. So there were things that were said like that. It's also weird because um, we'll talk about it later. But there's they try to lobby that at her at Nomadland. But I'll, but I would argue I would argue by watching the films. I thought she was very respectful towards it. She didn't glorify them. She didn't she she didn't make them saints. I think as I think to me songs my brother taught me is complimentary with, with, with Wind River. It's like there's two different ways of going about it because the guy who directed Rin River, he was in he was a white guy who was in their culture his whole life. And they trusted him with making that movie. But that's kind of more traditional Hollywood shot movie in a sense. Mm. And and this one's more shot like in that quasi Terrence Malick, like I don't want to say faux faux doc- documentary is too disrespectful, but she does go for that quote unquote realism. And then there's there's something to be said because some people say there's a plus and it's a minus. I think it's a plus. Overall, people say it's a plus, but getting people who aren't actual actors in a sense, so they're not really like hitting those beats like a, a classical actor would. Like, dit, 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 dit. this is the perfect. Like, you know, how, when, when you're a trade actor, they know how to hit those emotional beats just like that. Whereas in these two movies, these people feel a bit more real. But there's that documentary feel because even though th- th- it's not like the. the, the the, the it's shot like they know the camera's there, but it does feel like they know the camera's there. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I, mean, I think I think it was described as kind of semi-fictional. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah, which is a good, kind of good middle ground. So I guess what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think she did a really respectful job, to be honest. And you know, like like we were saying back in the day, Hollywood they just didn't care, did they? I mean, frankly, white people didn't care about Native Americans anyway for God knows how many centuries or whatever and hollywood was just an extension of that you know even going up to to films like dances with wolves that was really trying <laughs> god bless yeah. dances with wolves it was trying yeah but it was just a product of its era you're talking about i mean that's like 30 years ago that film and things have moved on so much since then and i think you know maybe sometimes in certain situations if the outsider is the right outsider someone who has lived around a bit she, you know she's gone from like china to london to new york to la and then she just like you know seems to love dakota like maybe someone who is worldly she's like similar age to us as well yes. you know like 
modern enough but but kind of like steeped in in kind of respect and tradition enough to to sort of guide something with a tender hand i don't think she ever stepped over the line i mean uh, not that it's my judgment to make because i'm not native american like i totally understand if someone was like no i don't think she should have done that or this or that that's totally cool i just mean from as independent a point of view as i could say i i think to me she she represented the communities like in you know it, it wasn't like like you said it wasn't didactic it wasn't really particularly judgmental either it was just presenting it as it was i think that's all you can really do as a filmmaker when you're not part of that community and it also means that it wasn't too melodramatic even though there were so many dramatic moments they were kind of you know gifted with a light touch i would say which which really helped um the the flow of it and also the i, I guess the kind of you know the feeling that you're not watching um, a documentary and you're not watching a melodrama. It just kind of sits really nicely in the middle. I feel like I got I, I got so much from it, um, but I, I don't I don't know how kind of like I mean you'd know more about this I guess, but how kind of true all of that was like in terms of like the actors and the story and stuff like that. Because I know more about the writer, but what, what about this one? Yeah, this one is far more fictional than uh, the writer was. This one was basically like she observed her thing, like she observed the situation and she like took all the experiences that she saw and kind of like put them in that. But she 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 did run it by those people before she says she doesn't like tell them like she's like even with the even when she did shot Nomad Land with the way with those people who are nomads who like live life on the road or like that. She never tells them like this is the story. She she lets them tell them tell her like this is how the story goes. And then she kind of writes the script to that rather than, okay, this is the plot. And because she, she, she said her philosophy is, she's like, if you plan too much, then you won't get those moments that I I try to go for in these movies. Like if you try to plan it down to the T, then it's kind of going against what I'm trying to go for. It's like I, I I try to collaborate with these people, and this is their story as well. So it's not me telling them like this is the story is going to go. It's like this is this is the outline half of the story. Um, but she refined that later on. It's like she 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 she's it's a, it's a little bit slightly more scripted as she goes along with these movies. Of course, the Marvel movie is going to be a little bit more. But as as she went along from this one to the writer to No Man Led, like she 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 scripts it a little bit more, but at the same time she gives the act the non actors and the actors enough room to kind of like work with her to kind of get that story told. So she's not dictating like this is I'm telling your story for you. It's like we're telling the story together, and I'm going to use it and I, and I need your help to kind of help me tell the story. That's how she works. It will probably work quite in her benefit for the Eternals then, because, you know, I think in particular with this film, there's a very clear kind of like, what do you call it? Like a sort of mission statement right at the beginning of the film when, you know, what it, I don't know exactly what the quote was, but when you're talking about the horse and um, how you don't want to take all of the wild out of that horse, you need to leave a little bit out, uh, a little bit of wild back in the horse. Otherwise, it just won't kind of, you know like fulfill its purpose or whatever the quote was. And I was like, okay, this is about that film. Um, uh, this is about the kind of like about the main guy and this will be his journey throughout the film where he's kind of going to veer left and right and and all this kind of stuff. But basically if, if he just gets kind of all the life kicked out of him, then at the end he will just not live out his dream, which is to go to Los Angeles, which his brother says you should go and he knows that he should go and his girlfriend wants to go as well, you know, to a certain extent. But you kind of know, like, pretty early on that, okay, this is probably not going to happen. But what I love about the film is that at the end, I would say that it really could have turned into one of these things where you're like, oh man, okay, depressing. He doesn't get to live out his dream. He's not going to do this. But actually, he's making a positive choice not to walk out on his family, which is something that he has to kind of recognize about his own father who had children with 25 children with nine different women. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so he's kind of like looking at it thinking, well, what would happen to my little sister? You know, what would happen to my mother? All these kind of things. So he's making that choice consciously and that's what I really loved about the film. That's what I really loved about the ending. It just took a while and a bit of a meander to get there when sort of mixed with the, the sort of more visual elements of the last, uh, last half an hour. But uh, I, I don't know what you thought. I mean, how do you think it was kind of presented in that that respect? So, let me go back to what you were saying. So if you're comparing between the writer and um, Solid Brother Taught Me, you're, you're feeling like is, is, your, is your critique, not necessarily a negative critique, but it's like an observational one, is that she was a little bit more, she's a lot less lyrical in the writer, even though she still was lyrical, but 
but it was more it was more controlled than than in songs my brother taught me is that what you're saying absolutely i think that i think um songs is much more lyrical literally down to the script writing of like these kind of that the, you know like i said there's kind of like a mission statement and then you've got a couple of punchlines throughout the one that you quoted where, where cody his brother says to the mum. i mean that was like a bang line that was like a mic drop moment literally and um uh, whereas in the rider is it's really nothing like that i think it's much more strong imagery in that like indelible imagery you know i always kind of make this point about hbo hbo is so successful because they've always focused on really strong imagery you may not be able to sort of remember every single quote from game of thrones or sex in the city or whatever but you will have certain images just you know burned into your mind because they're so strong and they take such care with it i think that's more what she does with the rider and i think that's why don't get me wrong the, the narrative arc of the film is is like you know interesting and the fact that it's a real life story afterwards you're like what oh my god you know like all these things you're reading about it you're like oh wow okay that takes it to a next level but actually you know the her job is presenting it in a fascinating way that really makes an impression and that film really makes an impression to me so i mean should we just wrap up songs and then kind of like we'll move on to the rider so so i mean what would you finally say about songs no, to me, I feel like I, I put songs my brother told me in the same category as Fruit Val Station because um, she is friends with Ryan Coogler. So th- they all, it's weird because it's crazy how those people are connected. She went to school with Ryan Coogler. Her teacher was, one of her teachers in NYU was Spike Lee. Oh, wow. So, yeah. And she was to tell a story like they used to argue about like technique and stuff like that all the time. So it's that, so she's, she's well, she's known with these people. Like she's been respected a, a while ago or stuff like that. So I, going back to Fruit Val Station, I feel like I put it in the same category as Fruit Val Station. It's like for you to start your movie, and I always, and, and, and this is where I, I'm gonna get my a little bit of my soapbox right now for minority for minority directors. When you see like my when you see like directors like uh, like a Martin Scorsese or um, Christopher Nolan or Darren Aronofsky stuff like that, like they get worshipped to the high heavens for their first couple of movies or first movies that are kind of still rough around the edges. But you see that potential, but then they get lionized and canonized. And there's an argument to be made that these that these movies that Ryan Coogler and Cody Zhao made are more recent. But I always go back to is like your first movie, your because some because because most of the time when people make their first movies, they're really rough around the edges and they're not in no disrespect, but they're not really like you don't see that like holy shit this is this, this is somebody's gonna be somebody. Those are those are more harder. To, to see with first movies. Most of the time, you're like, they got two or three movies for to get their stride going, okay? And now they're off and the race is running. It's very rare that when you see a first movie, and you go, holy shit. It's like, there may be some issues here and there, but overall, the complete work of that first movie is very impressive. So I kind of put this movie in the same category as Fruit Foul Station. And it's very sim- it's, it's, it's similar in a way because they're almost both shot in a way where you're following the daily life of normal people. You're not dealing with somebody who's like a like like a, a middle class person or upper class person or even somebody who's like the quote unquote norm. These are like people who are like on the out out layers of at least American society. I don't know how it is anywhere else. And but you are following these people and you get a very strong point of view and a very talented point of view. And then you see their second movie and you're like, wow, that's a crazy ass jump from the first or second one. So this is just for me saying that. Um. I've seen her other movies, and I, and I think they're stronger than this one. But for me, for a foundation, I thought it was, I was very impressed by it. Yeah, I totally agree. As, as a debut, you know, I think we can make the hip hop analogy that you know, when you come to making your first rap album, you've had all those songs your whole life, and and no wonder so many debuts are so good. And then you have the sophomore slump. For film, <laughs> it's completely different because for a director, they have to navigate so many different things, and they have to learn how to deal with people and companies and this and that, and you know, the actual actors and the technical side of it, and it is just so much. Like it would make your head explode. So for a first one to be this good is is really fantastic and you know I, th- I think she's definitely on that trajectory so we will come to the rider after this short break okay so the year is 2017 and um chloe releases her second film it's called the rider this one wow i mean 
I guess like because I only finished it like this evening, then it's kind of just still sinking into me. So I'm really looking forward to sort of learning a bit more from you about this film and kind of just letting it wash over me even more. So okay, because I you know I had a chance to I had a chance to read like a couple of things, but that was it. So go on, what were you gonna say? Okay, let me start with this. So okay, so when you watch so when you watch songs my brothers taught me, right? I'm I'm gonna try it this way. So you had a, a, a kind of idea of what she was doing with that first one. So before you even start this one, did you have any did you have any expectations or any ideals of what you're about to watch, or did you have or did you use like like a blank slate? Did you think like because when you watch the first few minutes of it, do you feel like this was going to be like on that same path? Because it kind of feels like the same similar kind of like cinematography in a sense. Yeah, completely. I mean, I, like I knew nothing about this other than the name and when it was released. <laughs> so I didn't, you know, I didn't even know. Okay, you could tell from the sort of the the. the the artwork or whatever it's called that the, it's going to be another western okay fine but um i didn't didn't know anything about it i didn't know how well it had done at all the film festivals i didn't know it was based on real life and nothing so so but very soon i was kind of like okay this is going to clearly follow a very similar path to the other one um let's see where this goes because she can't just do the same thing all over again i mean that would yeah. just be ridiculous um so yeah so so okay what did you um what, what did you make of this film then i put the, for me personally just for me, I put alongside Mother as two like two of my favorite movies on on this level. If you taking taking away blockbusters or typical Hollywood movies stuff like that, just on that level, take me back to my film school days where people are like more. Not to say that other movies aren't ambitious and bold. Like the way people f- praise f- Parasite is the way I feel about this movie. Like I love Parasite. I think it's an incredible movie. But for me, this is this is the way I feel about. Be the way people Hollywood or film fans feel about Parasite is the way I feel about this one. So um, when I first when I first watched it, I felt like after watching Songs My Brother Taught Me, I sat down and watched it, and the first thing off the bat was okay. Even though I was I was shocked to find out that the that the budget for this movie was um, lesser than the uh, the the original with than Songs My Brother Taught Me because that one didn't do so well. So the budget so the money that she raised for this one wasn't as much. Um, but the interesting thing was, um, she's she's dating her cinematographer who who, who did the cinematography for this one, and the one she did after this one, Nomadland. So I guess what happened was, I think that her and with with the cinematographer, his name is Joshua James Richards. I think that that first movie, like they learned what to do and what not to do, and I think that she came in, and this is what happened. She. She reasserted herself because she said that she felt like she was she was she was trying to do too much in that first movie. So with the lesser budget and what she says, like, you know, what, I'm going to focus on this guy's point of view and then I'm going to go for that. And I feel like just thinking about it as a, as a filmmaker, when I used to do it on my day, I feel like now that she knew what she needed to do and what not to do, I felt like she had more time going back to your thing you said earlier about with the images. I think that because she knew exactly what she wanted to do. That's how the images got stronger. And that's how they knew. Because, like, the, the big thing is, like, the way he lights, it's kind of like he lights at a certain time of day. That's way, that's that's the reason why those images pop so well. And you can only do that constantly if you know exactly what the fuck you're doing. As compared to, okay, I'm just going to go around and, free, and we'll let, I'm let the inspiration come to me. It's kind of like, okay, I'm still letting the inspiration come to me. But this time, I know what I'm doing. So I know what shots to get. Because, like, there's so many shots of, like, him looking out into the uh the expanse of like the uh the distance and like each one of those shots are totally different and they totally complement his mood each different time when he's going through and it's not in a way where it's like a like like typical like uh old school hollywood where it's like 10 commandments like you know what i'm saying it's not like that that grandeur it's kind of like he's he is a part of that culture it's not like it's making you go wow it's kind of like okay it's like okay this is what his life is like at this point right here and I just like it, it. The thing that shocked me about it is, is the way how and it's, and it's been said before in other reviews. Because I'm not the first one to say this. The, a lot of interesting things is how she shoots his relationship to the horses, and how the horses like you'll have him just train the horse for like five minutes, and he, that five minutes is telling you a, a story. Which is, I'm like, how the fuck did she do that? Like, how do you make a guy training a horse so interesting? And kind of like set it, and like each time he trains those animals, it's like ev- evolving as he's going throughout the story. And I'm like, how do you do that? And the way he shoots the animals, where even they're like characters in a sense. 
The animals were amazing actors. They're better, <laughs> better actors than I was. Like it was just amazing. But that 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 scene you just described in the middle that was the heart of the film. Just that five minute, like oh, just watching him. And th- this is real, right? This is him actually taming a horse. And it was just absolutely unbelievable. That was mesmerizing. That's one of the greatest things I think in modern cinema. That that scene alone, and. It, but if you saw that when you're kind of watching like a documentary or, or like, you know, a program on TV, rodeo stars, blah, 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 this is how they tame them. I mean, it wouldn't make anywhere near that impact because you wouldn't have the emotional connection. You wouldn't have the, the cinematography, you know, the direction of it all and all this kind of and the backstory as well. So it was just like absolute perfect storm. Just that scene alone. There, there were so many just incredible moments in this film because it's still sinking into me because I just finished it just today that uh, I'm kind of like I can't wait to watch it again when did you actually watch it though I watched it when she first got announced for Eternals which is like a while back because usually what I do is is when 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 Feige and them start telling them, like what director to go to and if I never hear about the director I'm like you know what I gotta check it out because the same thing happened with Taika Waititi because I knew about Taika but I didn't watch a lot of his stuff except for what we did in Shadows and then I kind of go back and see that stuff. And I, I try to devour all the things. Because usually nine times out of ten, the people who they pull out to start these movies, they do interesting shit. So if that, that must have, that was just before, I think it might have been before Ragnarok came out. I think that was the time I saw it, before Ragnarok came out. Oh, wow. Okay. So so like pretty much when it was released, like around that yeah. time. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, how do you think it's kind of stayed up? since since that last you know this kind of last three years like uh, it, both both kind of personally and on a more cultural level to me i really feel like i, I this is his, this is my theory it's going to happen she's going to make that other movie and it's going to be big and she's going to go back and people want to do that thing right there but i do think that going back to what i said about the, the scorsese's and the nolans and the tarantinos that get worshipped on there i i hope if if the world, if if, if the, especially if the UK and America makes it out alive in the next fifteen years, um, <laughs> and we can come to our fucking senses, um, I really think if she continues, like to say, I saw all three movies right now, and I feel like not not the not the ch- change your point of view, like we can come back to that later, do a minor review on No Man Land later. I think she gets better with each movie, and um. I just think, like, for me, this movie, I, to be honest with you, I think, I would argue that, and this may be hyperbole, but I think this is better than most of the quote unquote best picture things of Hollywood the last couple of years. I really believe that. I really believe that this movie is a lot be- is better than most. You're saying that this is better than Green Book? How dare you say that? <laughs> I would, I, 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 she says, <laughs> I try, to, I'm trying to remember that movie, guy. Please, I'm trying to remember that movie. Christ. Yeah, this is better say, than Green Book. Sorry. Yeah, I, I would say, I would say the only competition I would say to this movie would probably be Parasite, the last couple of years. On, on that quality and execution, I would say, or, or that level of sophisticated filmmaking, I think. But for me personally, I put, for me personally, for my personal taste, I put this with Mother as far as like, just a bold expression that knows exactly what it is and what it's trying to do, and it makes no apologies for what it is. It's like the work of somebody who knows exactly what they're going for and they achieve that goal. And I just like the fact that um, she doesn't shove. And she made this. She made this point. She's like she was a political science major in in, in uh, college. She wanted to be a politician. She wanted to change the world. And she's like very quickly she found out that she doesn't want to be a part of that world because that's not for her. So she felt like she could probably be better being an artist or trying to express an ideal. Because she is a comic book nerd and she is a uh, she loves manga. She watch she writes she writes fan fiction, but she doesn't tell anybody who her fan fiction name is because it's kind of embarrassing. So um, she's a she's a nerd that can do sophisticated work like this, and that's even more impressive. Okay, so last couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. First of all, how do you think? Because in this, it's much less explicit that this was based where it was based and it was within the similar well the same community right the Lakota Sioux yes there's a guy in the same, there's a there's a guy his friend is in both movies yeah i thought so okay i thought okay yeah yeah the tall guy right yes yeah okay fine so but i mean it, i would argue that in songs it, it's pretty explicit whereas in here i i mean i didn't really realize it at first because like i said i went into this film blind 
And um, I just thought they were like white people, basically. So, you know, so I don't know. I don't know like, uh, <laughs> you, the mix exception. Because I, I, I get, the, I get that, that person, but he's not the, but he's not that typical. The, 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 the thing to defend that is his, his family is not that typical, quote unquote, white person that you see in these other movies, though. Like, you've never seen that type of guy. And if you do see that guy, he doesn't come along so often in these movies. In what respect? In the respect of. He, if you watch that movie and you see that culture right there, like whiteness is not necessarily a priority if you catch my drift. Like, like the typical, like quote unquote. If you if you think of how a, a if you quote unquote like think of how like a white person is in a sense, it's kind of like um like they Hollywood mostly films about middle class white people or well off white people or successful white people. They don't really as much go in that area. Where like they're among other they're they're among they're in they're among another culture and they're a part of that culture like his culture he has and he he is in a native, he is partly Native American he is in that culture you don't normally see that person in that culture in these kind of films like if you do see a kind of person like from his stature it's more along the lines of like the like like live, living in trailers but they're not but they're not a part of like a in, like Native American culture they're more a part of lines of like okay. We came from this. We're, we're Southern people, and our heritage is from the South, Confederate flag and stuff like that. But there's none of that to be found in this movie. Mm. But I'd say I'd say it's much more in the background in in the rider, and it's much more in the foreground in songs, though. Yeah, but he's not fully. But he's still. But if you look, if you look at the detail of that movie, I, if you watch it again, mm. and you see how they move from like that, like the feather in his hat and stuff like that, it's a certain way he moves, a certain way they communicate with people, a certain way it's just like. He's he's normally interacting with these people in a sense, but he's still in that culture because if you look at this, if you look at um, songs my brothers taught me, is they are even those people are a part of that rodeo culture at the same time too near the end of the movie, like they are a part of that thing. And then if you see in the background when he's when he's talking to the people when he goes when he goes in that scene where he's he, he, dad's like don't ride the horse again, he doesn't want to do it. And if you look around him, he is around those people, and it's like normal to him. It's not like it's he's he's entering a place where he's not among those people on a normal basis. Okay. Even those even those kids even those kids that say, "Hey, what's up, Brady?" Remember when he's in the um the supermarket? Yeah. And you got the two native kids, and they come up there and they go, "Hey, Brady," blah blah blah, like that. It's like a normal thing to those people. Like they they look up to him, and he's a part of their culture in a sense, but not as like you said, it's not as much as in how my brother told me. But they are still a part of that because you got to remember, remember how my brother taught me, like her. That one, the one brother of hers is is far more whiter than his, the other brother and sisters are, hmm. and they're kind of melded in together. Because remember, she's like, "I wish I could stay with you," and then the brother and the the whiter brother and Sasha brother taught me he was like, "Well, you, well, he wasn't necessarily, our father wasn't necessarily a good a good um, figure in my life, even though I had him in my life. So I don't know how much better you'd have been off with him." Hmm. I mean, like wrapping this up, I think it's really interesting the way that these were both named as well, because the first one was Songs My Brothers Taught Me, and this one is just The Rider. So it's clearly much more focused on The Rider himself. But also I just think that it's fascinating because I think Songs My Brothers Taught Me, I'm not sure how much I got from the title expounding that in the actual film itself compared to The Rider. Because the, the rider is just such a like a bulletproof name where you're just like, okay, this guy is the rider. He's born to be the rider. He's being told he can't be the rider. He can no longer be the rider, but he wants to be the rider. You know, it's, it's like really kind of like just the central tenet to the whole thing. Whereas songs my brothers taught me is just much more kind of like expansive and much more kind of all over the place. Like not not as a judgment. I'm just saying it's generally kind of like depicts lots of different things and aspects of that community. So I, I just think that focus really benefited on um, on the rider. So for me, I don't know. I mean, just, yeah, I'll, I'll give it some time. And then probably when Nomadland comes out, and then I'll, I'll probably like check for it again. But uh, I mean, just my own personal thoughts, just exceptional. And like you're saying, I think you can just sometimes see someone's trajectory. And like, I haven't seen, obviously I haven't seen Nomadland, but I can imagine it's going to be great the the reviews are, are fantastic for it um, there's a lot of oscar talk etc so i mean let's just see where it goes i, th I think we're, we're onto a good one here really um much more so i'd say even than I, i'd say comparing like comparing the rider to some of the other films we've covered from the other marvel directors like their pre-marvel work i think the rider is pretty much like 
out there as the outstanding one by quite some distance. I don't know if you'd agree with that. I agree with a certain extent. I would argue that Kugler and her have the best work so far out of there for two different reasons. Even though I would I, I would say you had to see how Eternals works out, but even she said, even she made a point like Marvel is letting her do her thing, and they put the investment into there into her vision and stuff like that. She is they they are letting her shoot the way she wants to shoot, and those movies are going to Eternals arguably so far from her point of what she said it could change. You never know. I don't, feel, I don't feel like she's a person to kind of say that. But they are letting her shoot Eternals the way she shoots her movies. And there, she, she, when you see Nomadland, from my point of view, she, it's, it's even more refined than a writer. And she has a, she has a particular style beyond just going, um, she's a Terrence Malick light. She does have her own kind of like, what you call it. But um, I would say her and Coogler have the most specific voices out of the group. But I would I, I would concede that it's hard because you know what I'm saying. But I, I would say out of all of them, I was I would agree with you that the writer's probably like the most impressive out of all of them. But I would I would I would also argue that her creative output is similar to Kugler's as far as as far as they have and they have a perspective, they have a goal, and they hit that target. Yeah, and I can only speculate because I haven't seen it, but Nomadland must be like kind of this on crack because if you've got like an Oscar-winning actress to work with in, instead of someone who's like not an actor. Uh, the, yeah. the thing that I was going to – like the very, very final point because we do need to wrap this up is I was just going to ask what – so because I didn't have time to kind of delve into it. So the, the Jandro family who are like the real people in this, yeah. So so what was the kind of deal with that? Because I, I get that, okay, this was a lot of this was rooted in reality, but what was the kind of like before and after of of them being in this film? I know it had a I know it had a um it had a long um uh mark not marketing, but you know how they go to festivals. So it's basically like they've been they've been with each other for like a while now. So kind of like that. I think she does I from what I understand because here's the other thing. Because the guy that's in, um, the, the the tall guy that was in Tom Brother told me and his friend and the writer, he's also in No Man Land. Oh wow! So, <laughs> yes, yes. So she does. So she does have a, a a thing for keeping in touch with these people. I don't necessarily. Know, the The only thing I have to say is, I don't. I think they're they're happy from the interviews I've seen with him and her. That uh, Brady, he says his big thing is he's not as depressing. He's not as depressed and st- stolid as his character in that movie. He's more of a joker. He's more of a clown. So that character you see on there, like even though you're you're seeing the story, his name is Brady Blackburn in the movie, not Brady Jandrow. Yeah. So it it is his story, but there are things that had to be dramatized to get the the feeling of the movie across. But um, his sense of humor is is is. I mean, he has some humor in that movie a little bit. He is a, like a, a friendly guy, stuff like that. But he's a lot more. He's he said his character in the movie is somewhat like him. He's like, but it's 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 not him. It's like it's his experience in his life, stuff like that. But they made sure that that Brady Blackburn is a different character from Brady Jandrell right there. Yeah, I mean, it has to be right. If you think, yeah. take it back to Rebel Without a Cause and James Dean. Take it back to Eminem and Eight Mile. All these kind of things. You've got a young angry man who's like battling the world everything is against him you know like even like you we were talking about um well we weren't talking about it but i was going to mention that these guys are struggling for money as well i mean the guy in the first film you know he's selling alcohol to do this and that and and trying to get by and in this one as well they're really struggling for money and all this kind of stuff that there's just so much going on they're, they're getting battered from every which way they possibly could be and it's about that just will to survive and i think you know in the rider, you look at his right hand and that that kind of, I can't remember what it was, but the kind of partial seizures of his right hand, the way that they describe it. And it's such a like, it's such an ultra literal kind of like manifestation of his whole situation where he wants something, but he can't let go. He physically can't let go of wanting to be a rodeo rider. And at the very, very end, you know, just like in the first film, he decides okay, I can let go of this. There is something more important. His his dad turns up and his sister turns up and that is what turns his whole life around potentially. So, you know, I think that was a great ending. And, and if we sort of 
take take it back to the first film, the way that that ended compared to the way that the rider ended. I think the rider was much more focused in it. And it, you don't need everything tied up with a neat bow on it or anything like that. But you just just the way that you finish it does matter. And I think I think she just nailed it with that. Okay, well, that was really interesting, and um, I hope you found it interesting too. Don't forget to check us out on Twitter at uh, Podcast Rebels and on Facebook at Transatlantic Rebels Podcast. And we will be back with another one really soon. In fact, that one is, well, hasta la vista, baby. (laughs) Jesus. (laughs) All right, come on. (laughs) And stop. Stop.